Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 17, water pollution. Uh, we left off in part one talking about uh, pollution of lakes and rivers, and now we are going to move on to talk about groundwater. So what are the major groundwater pollution problems? Well, chemicals used in agricultural industry, transportation, and homes spill and leak into groundwater. Again, this water uh, leaches or percolates through, uh, through the soil uh, and eventually gets gets into that groundwater. Protecting groundwater through pollution prevention is less expensive and the most effective strategy because what we're going to talk about over the next couple of slides is that unfortunately, unlike let's say rivers, which can clean themselves uh, themselves rather quickly, uh, groundwater takes a long time uh, to clean itself. And we'll talk about the reasons why uh, as we go through uh, the next couple of slides. So again, uh, groundwater uh, going to be, uh, again, it's going to be less expensive if we protect our groundwater water initially uh, rather than having to uh, clean up uh, after we pollute the groundwater. So once again, groundwater cannot cleanse itself very easily. Why? Uh, well, again, what are aquifers? Aquifers are drinking water sources uh, for about half of the U.S. population. Again, aquifers are basically reservoirs underneath the ground. Common pollutants that affect our aquifers are fertilizers and pesticides, gasoline, organic solvents. And again, we spoke about fracking, which is again, uh, breaking up uh, the shale rock to get the natural gas out. Well, unfortunately, uh, that also uh, pollutes the groundwater as well, that process. Uh, slower chemical reactions occur in groundwater due to the slow flow. Uh, again, the contaminants are not diluted. Again, the groundwater is not flowing quickly like a river. It's more like a lake, and so you're not getting the dilution of those contaminants uh, like you do in a river. There's less dissolved oxygen uh, underneath the ground, um, and as a result of that, there's fewer decomposing bacteria uh, that can help work on some of these uh, some of these uh, pollutants that could be in the groundwater. Again, we spoke about how uh, in lakes, uh, especially, and in, and in, and in uh, rivers, um, you get that decomposing bacteria that can actually work on uh, the, the pollutants. It causes a dead zone, uh, but it actually does clean out the water. Well, unfortunately, under the ground, in the groundwater, you don't have a lot of oxygen, and so you can't really get a lot of this uh, uh, bacteria. And as a result, again, uh, the chemical reaction actions are slower, and so groundwater cannot cleanse itself as easily. In addition, colder temperatures, uh, if you remember back from your chemistry days, most chemical reactions occur fastest when uh, the temperature is hot. When you cool down temperature, most chemical reactions uh, take slower, and yet another reason why uh, groundwater takes a, a long time to cleanse itself uh, uh, because of these factors. So definitely understand these factors. Again, groundwater or the, uh, the the pollution of groundwater is a is a, a degradation of our natural capital. Uh, here's a chart of, or a, a visual here of some principal sources of ground groundwater contamination in the United States. Uh, so again, we got gasoline, we got de-icing road salt. Example, we have landfills uh, that can leach some uh, toxic and some uh, pollutants into the groundwater. Obviously, just uh, just normal residential uh, living with uh, septic tanks. We'll talk about septic tanks in a couple of slides. Uh, so again, just understand ways that um, groundwater can get polluted, not on this uh, map, uh, but another way is through the withdrawal of too much uh, groundwater from aquifers near coastal areas. We talked about this in a previous chapter. If you withdraw too much water from freshwater aquifers near the coast, then that salt water could potentially get into the freshwater aquifer. Once the salt water is in there, that aquifer is useless. You can't use it for drinking. You can't use it for irrigation. And again, it takes a long, long time uh, to get that salt water out of there and to get the fresh water uh, to return. Groundwater pollution is a hidden threat. Again, we can't see it. Uh, but unfortunately, for instance, in China, 90% of the shallow groundwater is polluted, and about 37% of it is so polluted that it cannot be treated for use as drinking water. Liquid hazardous waste are injected into the ground in disposal wells here in the United States. Again, we don't see that, but sometimes those wells can leak and those hazardous wastes can get into our groundwater. EPA cleaning up leaking uh, underground storage tanks. They are trying to do this. Uh, slowly degradable waste, again, can take decades to thousands of years to clear once you uh, get it into the groundwater. Non-biodegradable wastes remain in the water permanently, so they don't get uh, uh, biodegraded. And once again, prevention is the most effective solution because once you get your groundwater polluted, it is really very, very difficult to clean it out. So uh, again, our favorite
favorite charts here, uh, groundwater pollution, prevention, some cleanup. Uh, so let's look at the prevention, find substitutes for toxic chemicals, keep toxic chemicals out of the environment, obviously, uh, require leak detectors on underground tanks. This way, if the tank does begin to leak, we will know above ground and be able to dig it up and, and, and basically fix the leak. Ban hazardous waste disposal in landfills and injection wells and store harmful liquids in above ground tanks with leak detection and collection systems. What can we do if we get our groundwater polluted? How can we clean it up? Well, you got to pump it to the surface, clean it, and then return it to the aquifer. Again, very expensive. Some other ideas, uh, inject microorganisms to clean up the contamination, less expensive, but still costly. And that is a budding uh, area in, in environmental science, these microorganisms that can actually be injected into areas to clean it up. So uh, something, uh, if you're looking to get it, go into uh, uh, some kind of career path, that could be a career path for you as well, which could actually combine environmental science and biology, if that's something you're interested in. We could also pump nanoparticles of inorganic compounds to remove pollutants. But again, that is still being developed. So another area, uh, if you are interested, uh, that could be a, a career path for you. So again, uh, the moral of the story, you don't want your groundwater polluted because once it is, it takes forever to clean up. So again, prevention of that uh, prevention of that pollution uh, is the most important uh, in the important aspect here. One case study talks about arsenic in drinking water. Arsenic-rich rocks uh, can contaminate wells. Uh, Long-term exposure to arsenic uh, likely to cause skin, lung, and bladder cancer. Levels especially high in Bangladesh, China, India's state of West Bengal, uh, and parts of northern Chile. Treatment approach, rust nanoparticles removed with a magnet. So you actually use a magnet to take out the nanoparticles of the rust out of, out of the water, and that removes the arsenic from the water. But obviously, again, that's a very uh, cost, uh, very costly and takes a long, long time. So the uh, idea here is to uh, not get that arsenic uh, in the drinking water uh, to, to uh, begin with. All right. How do we purify drinking water? Well, reservoirs and purification plants can help uh, process sewer water into drinking water. I'll actually talk a little bit about that in the next chapter. Uh, expose clear plastic containers to intense sunlight, UV, uh, which actually kills infectious microbes. So if you shine UV radiation on plastic containers and on things, it actually will kill uh, and any microbes that are there. Uh, and the life straw filters, uh, viruses and parasites. So something called life straw uh, can also help purify drinking water. And then we talk about, is bottled water a good option? Well, bottled water can be useful, but it is expensive. Uh, the United States has some of the world's cleanest drinking water, yet we use a lot of bottled water when really we should just be drinking out of the tap. Bottled water takes huge energy inputs and creates environmental problems. Why? Because making the plastic uh, to make the, uh, to, to, to put the water in obviously takes a lot of energy to make that plastic. And then uh, these plastic water bottles are basically discarded, 67 million plastic water bottles discarded daily in the U.S. And unfortunately, most end up in landfills, not uh, in recyclable areas, which is uh, unfortunate. Again, here, uh, most of us put our uh, plastic bottles in recyclables, but other parts of the country uh, don't necessarily do that. So unfortunately, most of them end up in landfills, where again, it takes uh, a long, long time uh, for that plastic to be uh, biodegraded in the landfills. Landfills. All right, so we do have some U.S. laws that were put into effect to protect drinking water quality. Uh, I would definitely have an understanding of these laws. In 1975, the U.S. Safe uh, Drinking Water Act was put into play. Uh, this sets maximum contain, uh, contaminant levels for any pollutants that affect human health. Uh, health scientists recommend strengthening the law, but various industries have lobbied to weaken the law. You know, uh, you know how this works, right? Uh, less developed countries, though, do not have laws. Or, or their laws are not enforced. So again, when we uh, we spoke about this earlier in the chapter, uh, obviously for us here in Ardsley in the United States, we really don't think of uh, not having clean drinking water, right? But in many parts of the world, in these less developed countries like India, we saw that uh, we saw some pictures earlier um, in, in part one of this lecture. Uh, again. Um, they don't have these laws or they're not enforced. And so a clean drinking water is a problem uh, for, for many people. You may have heard about this story just happened a couple of years ago. Uh, this was uh, in Flint, Michigan. In 2014, residents in Flint were exposed to dangerous levels of lead in their tap water, uh, mainly because of what was happening in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, 
pipes that brought the water to the people in Flint uh, were very old and basically were kind of uh, disintegrating. And so all that uh, all that lead from those pipes were going into the water that people were then drinking. Officials began withdrawing water from Flint River instead of Lake Huron, uh, failed to add chemicals to re- reduce leaching from the lead pipes because that was the real issue. Uh, public outcry resulted in water sorts uh, sorts switch back to Lake Huron because uh, obviously then the uh, the river uh, would have had its own issues. Uh, and so now here we are uh, years later um, and they're actually uh, replacing a lot of those pipes with newer pipes that again won't have the lead problem. All right, what are the major, so that was groundwater, okay, kind of talking about the aquifers and, and water that we, uh, that we use to drink and to irrigate our crops. Now we're going to talk about ocean pollution. So we've done rivers, lakes, groundwater, and now we're going to talk about ocean pollution. Most ocean pollution originates on land, all right? So it doesn't originate over the water. It originates on land, oil and other toxic chemicals, for instance, solid waste. Uh, And obviously these are all threats to fish and wildlife, right? They disrupt the marine ecosystem. So what is the key to protecting the oceans? Reduce the pollution flow from land and air and from streams emptying into into ocean waters. Again, the ocean is not producing its own pollution. It's us on land, humans, uh, in many instances, producing pollution that then runs off and eventually gets into our oceans. So ocean pollution is a growing problem. Uh, Municipal sewage from less developed countries are often dumped into oceans without treatment. Think about that for a second. That's all you want to think about that. But that that is happening, right? Um, This overwhelms the coastal water's ability to degrade waste. Again, the ocean has some natural capital, has some uh, ecosystem services for us, right? That it will, because it is kind of moving water, it will eventually uh, dilute a lot of that waste, right? Tide comes in, tide comes out, a lot of waves in the ocean. Uh, But unfortunately, in some of these less developed countries, they're putting so much sewage into the ocean uh, that it overwhelms the coastal water's ability to degrade it. And so it doesn't. Uh, deeper ocean water, again, you get the dilution, the dispersion, the degradation. All right, so there is some degradation, but in the deeper ocean waters, you do get a lot of dilution and dispersion of any uh, type of uh, of um of uh, pollution that may be out there. Uh, For our U.S. coastal waters, we have to deal with raw sewage, again, uh, which can contain some viruses, Uh, sewage and agricultural runoff as well. Those are your nitrates and your phosphates there. The harmful algae blooms that we talked about that produce those dead zones. And again, there they are, those oxygen uh, depleted zones. So again, these are a growing problem um, in many parts of the United States coastal waters. And again, uh, just some other things, residential areas, factories and farms all contribute to the pollution of coastal water. So again, just have a general idea here, you know, industry, nitrogen oxide, autos and smokestacks get into the ocean, urban small uh, sprawl, right? Bacteria, viruses from sewers, um, farms, runoff of pesticides, manure, right? You have construction sites, sediment, etc. So you know the deal here, guys, just understand uh, what you're seeing in this chart, understand uh, some of these um, um, these things that contribute uh, to uh, ocean pollution, to the pollution of our oceans. Now, there's a case study in here that I'm sure many of you taking this class have heard about. Uh, these are these big garbage patches that we're finding in many of the oceans. Um, so the North Pacific garbage patch, which is really the one you probably have heard of, are actually two rotating gyres of, uh, of, of garbage in the ocean. Particles float on or just beneath the water surface. 80% of this trash, however, comes from land. You would think way out in the ocean that, oh, it's boats, right? It's, 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 uh, or it's airplanes dropping this stuff in the ocean. That's not where the trash is coming from, right? The trash is coming from land and then it's making itself out or making its way eventually out into the open ocean. The tiny plastic pieces harm Harmful to wildlife, right? They hazardous chemicals move up through the food chain as these animals ingest these tiny pieces of plastic. And unfortunately, there's no practical way to clean it up because it's way out there in the middle of the ocean. So the best approach is to prevent the growth by reducing the production of solid waste on land uh, that eventually gets into the ocean. So for instance, here are the North Pacific uh, gyre uh, garbage patches. Again, I'm sure you guys have seen pictures of this. If you haven't, just Google uh, North Pacific garbage patch 
garage and you will see what these actually look like. Again, they're actually two vast, slowly swirling masses of small plastic particles. Um, and these are the main ones, but actually five other garbage patches uh, have actually been found uh, in the world's other major oceans. So it's not only the Pacific Ocean dealing with this, uh, all of the or most of the world's major oceans have a garbage patch in them. And again, this garbage is not coming from the ocean, it's coming from the land and eventually making its way out there, where now it's stuck. There's really no way we can clean it up. The best way is to stop increasing it, right? To stop adding, adding to it. So hopefully at some point down the road, uh, it, it, it ends up dispersing itself. Also got to talk about oil when we talk about ocean pollution, because most of our oil is actually, uh, or a lot of it is actually pumped up out of the ground uh, in oceans or over oceans. Uh, so crude and refined petroleum uh, from natural sources and human activities. Uh, so that's, again, this is where you can get or how uh, oil pollution gets into the ocean, all right? Crude and refined petroleum from urban and industrial runoff from land, largest source of ocean oil pollution just from normal human activities, right? We have a, a road out there, it rains, all that oil that's on the road runs off into a river, Sawmill River, for instance, that eventually gets into the Hudson River, that eventually gets into the ocean, right? Uh, we've also had some prominent pollution accidents. 1989, the Exxon Valdez was an oil tanker uh, that basically uh, ran aground and spilled a lot of oil. I remember that. I was, uh, how old was I? 14 years old when that occurred, 13 years old. So I, I, I remember that. Uh, and in 2010, maybe some of you remember that, uh, the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, this was also another oil disaster, which again, spilled oil um, into, into the water. Uh, we also have volatile organic hydrocarbons out there, which can kill many aquatic organisms as well. Um, Tar-like globs uh, occur on the ocean surface. When you have these oil spills, uh, this can coat animals' furs and feathers. And as a result, animals draw, drown or die from the loss of body heat. Uh, the heavy oil components sink to the ground or sink to the bottom of the ocean, which then smother bottom-dwelling organisms. So as you can tell here, guys, oil uh, does not oil and the oceans do not mix very well. Uh, faster recovery in warm water with rapid currents. Again, the warm water, chemical reactions will occur faster and the rapid currents will disperse the oil. Uh, in cold, calm water, the recovery can take decades. Current cleanup methods only recover about 15% of the oil from major spills. They actually, uh, the rest of the 85% uh, is just left to a mother nature to deal with, which are with, with, with her ecosystem and ecological services, right? Uh, the natural capital. Uh, and one, one method for presenting, uh, preventing oil spills will have, would be to have double hole tankers, basically two holes. So if one breaks or one ruptures, leaks, you have another hole to, to basically keep the oil in there. All right, so here's a, here's a picture of the Deepwater Horizon uh, drilling disaster. This was in the Gulf of Mexico on April 20th, 2010, uh, about 64 miles south of Louisiana. Basically, it exploded, caught on fire, and then sunk. But what you realize is that there's a pipe coming up from the ground that is pumping up all this oil. So as this thing exploded, it took a while for them to shut off that pump. So as this thing is burning, all this oil is coming out of the ground and just going right into the water, right? It takes a while for them to put the fire out and then finally get there uh, and to shut and to basically cap this pipe. Uh, and as a result, uh, millions of gallons of, of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. So case study talks about that Deepwater Horizon uh, rig spill. Uh, again, 3.1 million barrels of crude oil was released into the Gulf of Mexico before that well was capped. It contaminated a vast areas of the coastline caused by equipment failure and poor uh, decisions by the people who were actually uh, running that rig. Government since has developed new standards for offshore drilling procedures to hopefully not call, have something like uh, the Deepwater Horizon accident happen again. Okay, moving on, almost done here, guys. Uh, next section talks about how we, do we deal with water pollution. So we spoke about ocean pollution. We talked about aquifers, groundwater, rivers, and lakes. So now how do we deal with it? So how do we reduce water pollution? Well, obviously, number one, prevent it. All right, we want to prevent water pollution. Work with nature to treat sewage. Again, we're going to talk about uh, solid waste in the next chapter. But again, a lot of natural capital, a lot of ecosystem and ecological services out there that that mother nature provides us so let's work with mother nature to help us here and we need to use our natural resources more efficiently so 
How can we reduce ocean water pollution? Well, reduce the flow of pollution from land, right? Uh, land use, air pollution, link to energy and climate policy, all right? So all these things we can do uh, to help reduce the ocean pollution. Uh, again, one of our favorite charts here, coastal water pollution prevention, separate sewage and stormwater lines, require secondary treatment of coastal sewage, use wetlands and other natural methods to treat sewage, ban dumping of waste and sewage by ships in coastal waters, strictly regulate coastal development, oil drilling and oil shipping, and require double holes for those tankers. How do we clean up? Well, improve the oil spill cleanup capabilities, use those nanoparticles on sewage and oil spills to dissolve the oil or sewage. Again, still under development, but I do say this is a budding area. If you can figure out those nanoparticles, you might be a very rich person one day. So maybe again, somewhere, uh, if you're gonna be doing research in college in the next couple coming years, and you want to be in environmental science, maybe that's something you can look at, those nanoparticles that can help uh, clean up sewage oil spills, not only in the ocean, uh, but maybe in our groundwater, in our aquifers as well. How can we reduce water pollution from non-point sources? Again, these are sources where we don't know exactly where the pollution is coming from, like golf courses and lawns and farms. Uh, so how can we reduce that pollution? Well, use soil conservation methods, right? We spoke about that in a previous chapter to help uh, reduce the erosion uh, of soil. Use fertilizers that release nutrients slowly. All right, and do not use on st steeply sloped land so that those fertilizers run off into, in, 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 into, into uh, the water, into the rivers or the groundwater, etc. Reduce use and runoff of plant nutrients and pesticides, right? Plant buffer zones of vegetation and set discharge standards for nitrate chemicals from sewage treatment and industrial plants. These are all ways that we can reduce water pollution from non-point uh, sources. All right, we did have a case study in this chapter, talks about a bunch of the different um, acts that went into uh, effect, policies, things like that to help with reducing water pollution. I would definitely have a general understanding of these. Again, maybe not a detailed understanding, but definitely have a general understanding. The 1972-1977 Clean Water Act, the 1972 Marine Protection Research and a Sanctuaries Act, 1975 updated in 1996, that's the Clean Drinking Water Act, 1976, the Toxic Substance Control Act. 1980, the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, called CERCLA. 87, Water Quality Act. 1990, the Oil Pollution Act. Uh, experimenting with a, de a discharge trading policy that uses market forces. And again, what are some achievements of the Clean Water Act? So definitely uh, be able to answer to answer that question. All right. So last thing we'll talk about here is sewage treatment. Uh, sewage treatment reduces water pollution. So some uh, you may not know, but there are septic tanks that are used in rural areas. Basically here in Ardsley, we connect to a, a sewer system that goes to a central plant that then uh, takes your, uh, takes your uh, sewage. But I grew up uh, in Northwest Jersey. We actually had a septic tank. So each individual home has their own tank uh, that actually uh, holds the uh, holds the sewage. Um, wastewater or sewage treatment plants, again, that's what we get here in Ardsley. There are uh, basically three. Uh, there's a primary sewage treatment, which is a physical process. Secondary sewage treatment, which is a biological process to clean the water using bacteria. And then some of our sewage plants have a tertiary or advanced sewage treatment, which actually uh, uh, special filtering processes and maybe will bleach or disinfect the water uh, before it is sent back out uh, into, into the world. Many cities violate federal standards, however, for sewage treatment plants. Federal law requires primary and secondary treatment, but some uh, cities do get exemptions from that secondary treatment. Health risks result in swimming with water uh, with blended sewage waste. So again, you don't really want to do that. So what are we talking about here? Again, uh, this is a septic tank system in a rural area. Basically, your uh, your your sewage comes out from your house, right, uh, and goes into this uh, tank where the, the heaviest part, right, the sludge kind of sinks to the bottom. Then you get some stuff on the top with some wastewater that then goes into this field. And then the field has basically gravel that then filters out the rest of whatever happens to be in the wastewater. And then the water eventually sinks down into the ground and into the groundwater. So the idea is that once you go through the tank and then through the field, uh, you've actually cleaned most 
most, if not all, of the uh, harmful uh, pollutants out of the sewage water. So again, this is a, a septic. Uh, this is a septic tank. Again, I grew up with something like this. Most of us in Ardsley uh, don't have this. We connect to a into sewage pipes that go to a main sewage treatment plant, um, which we talk about here. So what are we talking about here? Again, uh, the primary and secondary um, ways to get rid of pollution. Primary ways is physical, right? You have your raw sewage comes in from the sewers. You have a screen that that traps or blocks a lot of the big stuff, right? Kind of keeps it right there. Then a grit chamber and a settling tank, which settles all the heavier uh, sewage out, which then goes through a sewage digester and then into a, a sludge drying bed. After it's dried, it could be used for fertilizer. The secondary is when then this water is brought into this aeration tank where there's actually some some type of uh, bacteria here that actually works to degrade any leftover particles. Maybe they're very, very small that they couldn't get, uh, so they wouldn't sink out or get trapped by a screen in the first, in the primary part of the primary process, right? So in the secondary, that water, uh, the, the bacteria to work on the, uh, the pollutants, the sewage, degrade it even more, get rid of it all. Then you uh, send that into a chlorine tank, which kills the bacteria. And then you send that water out to a river, lake, or ocean because at that point, uh, the water is clean of any sewage, okay? And again, this is uh, how sewage treatment plants handle it with the primary uh, and, the, and the secondary stage. And again, a little more on this uh, in the next chapter uh, when we talk about solid, uh, solid waste. All right, improving conventional sewage treatment, uh, remove toxic waste before the water goes to municipal sewage treatment plants. So that's uh, something we could do. Uh, reduce or eliminate the use and waste of toxic chemicals. Use composting toilet systems systems, which uh, is actually rather interesting. Uh, that means your, your toilet system, the, the, your poop basically kind of just stays there or you move it to a place where it kind of just... Uh, kind of just degrades itself, right, right with bacteria, and then you can use it uh, for fertilizing. Um, and we can have wetland-based sewage treatment sensors, uh, systems. We actually work with nature, uh, again, to actually act to, uh, act, an ecological service there uh, can actually act to purify, uh, purify your, your water. So these are ways that we can uh, improve conventional uh, sewage. All right. Sustainable ways to uh, reduce and prevent water pollution. We're almost done here. All right. In developed countries, bottom up political pressure to pass laws. In less developed countries, little has been done to reduce water pollution. For instance, China has plans for small sewage treatment plants, but there are not many out there. So again, how can we avoid producing water pollutants in the first place? That's obviously the key question uh, that we need to answer. So some more solutions, prevent groundwater contamination, reduce that non-point runoff, work with nature nature to treat sewage and reuse treated wastewater, find substitutes for toxic pollutants, practice the four R's of resource use, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle, reduce air pollution, reduce poverty, and finally, slow population growth. Final slide, what can you do to reduce water pollution? Well, fertilize garden and yard plants with manure or compost instead of commercial inorganic fertilizer. Minimize the use of pesticides, especially near bodies of water. Prevent yard waste from entering storm drains. Do not use water fresheners in toilets. Do not flush, flush unwanted medicine down the toilet. And do not pour pesticides, paint, solvents, oil, antifreeze, or other harmful chemicals down the drain or into the ground. If you do that, you can help uh, in preventing water pollution. All right, well, that concludes part two of my lecture on chapter 17, water pollution. And as always, thanks for listening.